I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. I'm your host, Don Kornegis, and I'm here today with IHMC's director, Dr. Ken Ford. Hello, Don. Good to be here with you. Today, we have a terrific interview with Dr. Barry Barish, who played an absolutely key role in the effort to fund and build the LIGO instrument that detected a gravity wave on September 15, 2015. This represents the first direct detection of gravity waves since they were predicted by Einstein back in 1916, and the first ever observation of the merger of a pair of black holes. The announcement of the detection in February made worldwide news. So this will actually be our second STEM Talk episode on the detection of gravity waves. Episode number six featured an interview with Michael Turner on this topic, and I urge the interested listener to go back and enjoy that interview as well. Let's hear the chirp signaling the detection of a gravity wave emanating from two black holes merging one billion light years away. Gravity waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time caused by a cataclysmic event. Like the ripples in a pond caused by a rock dropped into it. Of course, this is only an analogy. The detection of gravity waves confirms a major prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity and opens a new window into the cosmos. But before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we especially appreciate all the wonderful five-star reviews that are piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye towards selecting the best and most pithy among them to read on STEM Talk. <laughs> If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk shirt. Our winner is a review posted by someone who goes by the unpoetic and unpronounceable name CCPABC. In any case, thanks CCPABC for the great review, and here it is. Love the science-based discussions, which also includes the interviewers, who also know and understand science, a rarity among podcast hosts. Love the funny comments along the way. For example, stay curious, my friends, and walk into a Walmart to see epigenetics at work. Outlines, show notes, are also helpful for those of us who want to listen to specific sections again for better understanding. So thank you, CCPABC, and all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped make STEM Talk an immediate success. So on to today's interview. Barry Barish is a Lindy Professor of Physics Emeritus at the California Institute of Technology. He has for a long time been a leading light in several areas of physics. Barry became the principal investigator of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, otherwise known as LIGO, in 1994 and became its director in 1997. He led the effort through the approval of funding by the NSF National Science Board and the construction and commissioning of the LIGO interferometers. In October of 2002, uh, Barry was nominated by the president to serve on the National Science Board. This 24-member board oversees the National Science Foundation, but also advises the president and Congress on science policy issues. And these include not just science, but engineering uh, and education as well. Barry and I were both uh, involved in that freshman class in 2002. And we immediately connected and uh, worked together on the NSB for the next six years. Uh, terrific guy. And Barry is a recipient of so many awards and honors that it would take the rest of the show to recite them all. But suffice it to say that he has, through his own research and through his leadership, greatly shaped the scientific landscape in physics. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, Barry. This is Don Kornegis, and I'm here with Ken Ford. 
Hi to both of you. Hi, Barry. It's great to talk with you again. It's been a long time. and uh, it, it has been a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Barry, can you talk to us about how you got into science in the first place? What was your favorite subject growing up? Oh, growing up? Uh, maybe a roundabout way. I, I, I came from, a, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, and from a family that uh, neither of my parents went to college. So I didn't actually have much guidance. Uh, when I was young, I was probably I was probably a scientist before I knew it because I guess the first thing that I remember was uh, that was scientific. I think was was asking my father, maybe I was ten years old or eight or twelve or something, uh, why ice cubes float on water. That's the first question I can remember. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, he answered it in some you know halfway that ice expands or something, but then that didn't satisfy me, I remember, because that's the reason I remember it is because his answers never satisfied me, which is, I think, kind of the scientific mind. I mean, since since ice is made out of the same thing as water, it didn't make any sense to me that it got better. So, uh, but he half answered at least. L later, I remember uh, asking him a typical question, I think, that others have asked, but I didn't know that at the time, and that's why the sky's blue. And that's a much harder question to answer. Turns out I didn't know the answer to that in any real way until maybe I was a graduate student. Uh, that's uh, funny, Barry. That was the first question, or it's the oldest question I remember being flummoxed about and asking my uh, my poor father. Me you too. Know, and uh, <laughs> you know, here's this guy. You know, he's a, a working man. You know, and he's why is the sky blue? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. yeah. Do the yeah, same I, thing. <laughs> it, it, I, yeah, I think I think what well, we all look at. You know, half of what we see is up and it's blue, so it's a pretty natural question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A anyway, I I kind of was uh, very good. Luckily, I was very good at math and won a lot of prizes and things when I was young. Not kind of knowing. but And so I followed that kind of as a path toward something scientific or technical. Uh, I, w I grew up, that my family moved to Southern California, and I grew up in kind of the Hollywood area. Uh, and uh, I the, the furthest horizon I could see was Caltech, actually, which is where I am now. And that was where I thought I would go to college, uh, not knowing much about how hard it is to get in or isn't or anything. Uh, but I was a, a good student, so I probably uh, that was that part didn't matter. But I, I was the last class, I think the last class or one of the last classes in the LA City Schools to have a mid-year graduating class. So, so I graduated from high school in mid-year, but Caltech didn't take students and uh, took them once a year in the fall. So I went to Berkeley instead. Uh, kind of to pass time, I thought. And I started as an engineering student in Berkeley. I, I didn't know the, the, that you could actually have a job doing real regular science. I, di I didn't quite understand the difference. So I applied to, to study engineering. And I went to Berkeley because I could go in January or February. And of course, I immediately fell in love with Berkeley, fell in love with a young girl and uh, never was interested in Caltech by the time they had admissions <laughs> in the spring. So I went to school in Berkeley. I started as a freshman studying. Uh, so the first time into science was ex actually after my this, this half a semester uh, as a freshman in Berkeley, where I started as an engineering student. And uh, by default, I ended up in physics, which is science. And the default, by default, what I mean is that uh, I started in engineering and I had to take two courses, both of which I absolutely hated. One was uh, going around the campus, surveying the heights of and shapes and positions of buildings, a surveying course. And uh, I, I, I found it both boring and kind of embarrassing to carry, to move this thing around campus, you know, looking through and peering and making measurements. And the second was engineering drafting. And there I kept getting criticized for making poor arrowheads and things like that. <laughs> so um, in the meantime, I took I was taking freshman physics and freshman chemistry. And freshman chemistry, I, I also had problems with, but I didn't know why at the time. I, I every every Monday you'd come into freshman chemistry and take uh, they give you something with a big X on it. You're supposed to go through a set of procedures and figure out what it was. 
And some weeks I was fine and other weeks I couldn't do it. And when I couldn't do it, one time I uh, had a, <clears throat> a teaching assistant that I went to and I, I explained step by step what I had done, which was, of course, the right thing to do. And uh, his answer got me out of chemistry. He said, I probably didn't have my test tubes were probably weren't clean enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I always hated doing dishes anyway. So, so I went into physics. It's where I belonged because uh, physics has been great for me. But uh, I did it in this crazy haphazard way because I didn't, I didn't. I never had a really close mentor or, or or guidance to end up there. So that's how I started. Very cool. So Barry um, Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves, and 100 years later, his prediction is confirmed by the first direct detection of gravity waves. Can you talk about the long path from prediction to detection and maybe discuss some of the challenges at the level of technical and political and otherwise? Sure. So starting starting with Einstein, um, Einstein, for physicists, was just phenomenal in 1905 when he, within a period of a few weeks or a few months, uh, did three fantastic things. Uh, uh, one was basically E equals MC squared. Uh, another was relativity, was uh, the photoelectric effect. And these solved some longstanding problems in physics in no time at all. So he did that in 1905. And he, 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 then 10 years went by. And in 1915, he came out with a theory of general relativity, uh, which is really an extension of the theory of special relativity, which is what, what he did in 1905, adding accelerations instead of just velocities. And putting in accelerations means that's like gravity. It pulls on you. So, so that's why he did. First, the question is, why did he do it at all? Because we had a phenomenally successful theory of gravity that it stood for 300 years, probably the most successful physics theory of all time, which was Newton's theory of gravity. You know, explained everything from the tides to the orbits of planets and so forth and so on. And we all grew up thinking that the, you know, the apple fell because the earth pulled on it or we jumped up and the earth pulled down. And that turns out to not be the concept that Einstein had at all. So, so anyway, Einstein, I, th I don't think he did it to because uh, he knew that Newton's theory was flawed. There was only one, one place in 300 years where it didn't quite get the right answer, and that was the orbit of Mercury around the sun. Uh, each time Mercury goes around the sun, the planets pull it a little bit, and it goes back to a different place in its 75-year path. And uh, you can calculate it with Newton's theory. You don't get quite the right answer. Yeah. But in 1900, you probably weren't sure you knew where all the planets were, which, which ones there were. We're not even sure totally today. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he must have done it for totally theoretical reasons to add acceleration to the problem and maybe another kind of conceptual thing. And that is that uh, in, in Newton's theory of gravity, there's what we call instantaneous action at a distance. And that is when the apple falls, you see it immediately. And, you know, if, if something, if there's a gravitational field, you feel it right away. But when something happens in space, like uh, a star collapses or something, it takes light years for the information to get to us. So the, pro the concept of instantaneous action at a distance doesn't really work for gravity at long distances. Mm -hmm. And he probably realized that. Anyway, he created this theory after a lot of difficulty uh, in 1915. And in early 1916, he realized in analogy to the theory of electromagnetism that there would be uh, gravitational waves. But he didn't really prove it very well. He, he did it by analogy instead of from, fun from a fundamental proof. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, this comes back in the history a little bit. So in 1950, in 1916, he did that. In 1918, he found that he had made a factor of two error in the, the whole concept. And so he fixed it in 1918. And in at 1920 or 21, um, a British physicist went to the Southern Hemisphere and saw a phenomenon that wouldn't happen in Newton's gravity, but was predicted in Einstein's gravity, and that's the bending of light. 
So what he did is look at an eclipse of the sun, and as stars went behind the sun, their light bent, to, and he had, had exactly the amount that uh, Einstein had predicted. And that, that's actually what made Einstein a household name. Hmm. In, in uh, the beginning, in 1916, when Einstein predicted gravitational waves, he projected that it was a concept that he could conceive, that it existed, but it was too small to ever detect. And of course, that's because 100 years ago, he couldn't envision the kind of technologies that we've developed over 100 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he was looking maybe at simple projections of what he knew could be done, but we didn't have uh, lasers and, this and so forth at that time. So anyway, by the night, so there was no experimental subject at all. He, so this, this was on the table in 1916 by 19. 50s or 60, nothing, no one had ever looked at it experimentally. But uh, then in about 1960, uh, a student of John Wheeler's at, uh, uh, at Princeton, experimental student who had come back from the Navy and was kind of an electronics expert, um, decided to try to search for gravitational waves. And he used a technique that was very clever, uh, but different from now and not as sensitive. It was to make a great big bar of aluminum, a cylinder, a great big cylinder of aluminum about uh, uh, the diameter was about as tall as he was, as I remember, and it was maybe two or three meters long. And basically, then you have a great big uh, piece of pure material. And if you bang it with a hammer or something, it'll ring at some frequency. So the idea is that it's a, it has a resonant frequency where it rings. And if a gravitational wave came in and came through it, it would cause it to ring at this characteristic frequency. And he put very sensitive detectors on it. And it he's responsible in a very positive way for starting this field. It probably wouldn't have started anywhere near the time it did without him. Unfortunately, he was a very good technologist, but a very lousy scientist. And in, in the 1960s, he declared that he detected, so he got, he got things that rang. And then he wrote articles saying he found gravitational waves um, and uh, the first one was, I think, 1969. And these were quickly disproven by others. And he kind of ended up with a very mixed uh, career because he was bitter that people didn't believe that he saw gravitational waves, yet he started the field. The technique changed. And the reason the technique changed is that the effect itself is incredibly tiny, but it depends um, on how big the detector is. Basically, the effect is that the, a gravitational wave, if it goes through you or me, uh, uh, stretches you in one direction and squashes you in the other. So it's like, it's like uh, one of these mirrors in an amusement park where you get taller and thinner if you look at one and shorter and fatter if you look at the next one. And imagine going back and forth between them. So you get taller and thinner, shorter and fatter at the frequency of the gravitational wave. Of course, the effect is much smaller than in an amusement park. So what we do is we create something called an interferometer and it has a, it has a, a length in one direction and the other direction. You send the light at opposite dire uh, perpendicular directions and you send the light in a correlated way down the two arms, and it should come back at exactly the same time if the lengths are the same. So you set them that way, and then you invert one of the signals and they cancel. And so if you looked at what happens, the, the light from one cancels the light from the other and you don't get any light uh, in a receiver. The, if you then make one of the arms longer than the other because you squashed and stretched in opposite directions, then the lights no longer exactly comes back at the right time to cancel. And so you see an effect. And that, that's basically the idea that's used in, in interferometry and in what we do. So the idea is very simple. The, the, size, the, the size of how much it stretches or squashes depends on how big it is. So we make a, an interferometer that's huge. It's four kilometers on a side. And, uh, and then in order to make sure we aren't detecting something else like he did. We have two of them, uh, but on opposite side, uh, uh, 3,000 kilometers apart, one in Louisiana, uh, so kind of halfway between Baton Rouge and, and New Orleans, and the other in the state of Washington. The one in, in 
in uh, Louisiana is in uh, a pine forest. Uh, when we got the land, it was owned by Slumberjay. I think it's changed hands. And uh, and then the one in Louis in Hanford, Washington, is on Department of Energy, the big Department of Energy site. They're not near all the reactors and stuff, but they have a huge amount of land. And we ask that we see the same thing in both of them within the speed of light, which can't happen for for anything that's terrestrial. So that's the scheme. We we started this in the idea of doing it in interferometry instead of in bars. Um, started early, maybe the 1980s, early 80s. Uh, by 19 mid 90s, I, I was involved, and we proposed to the National Science Foundation in 1994. We proposed a little earlier, but the final decision was in 1994 uh, whether or not they would take it on. And it was expensive, of course. It was the b- biggest thing at that time that the NSF had ever considered taking on. Uh, We made a tactical mistake in calling it LIGO uh, because the last, that means laser, interferometer, LI, G, gravitational wave, and the O is observatory. Uh, The word observatory uh, is not a physics word. It's a word used by astronomers for their telescopes. And astronomers just felt this was a crazy, totally crazy project and kind of militantly went against us uh, that it shouldn't be done uh, spending all this money when you should be building some nice telescopes to look at the sky so we had a lot of resistance and i i think that's not true of uh, just true of this project i think if you think of doing science not necessarily physics but certainly in physics that's uh has the potential of a very high payoff it's generally high risk so usually if something isn't risky and you don't know the answers and you have to work at it hard uh, that all those things combine in the reason we haven't seen something before so in order to try to find something new you pretty well have to do something that's risky and pushes the technology and pushes the ideas that you have and oftentimes it doesn't work so taking on high risk high payoff projects is something the nsf uniquely does but I think more and more with time, it's harder and harder to in our system to do that. I'm not sure what we got approved by the NSF in 1994. That kind of thing could could get approved in today's in National Science Foundation. I'm not sure. Ken, of course, heard some of the debates. I didn't. Uh, we were both on the National Science Board together, and I was thrown out of the room anytime LIGO came up. But <laughs> he, he, heard, he heard a lot of the kind of, con- kind of controversy I'm talking about. At the time, I was uh, chairing the Committee on Programs and Plans, and uh, uh, certainly I got an earful um, about, <laughs> about why it was a dreadful idea. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting, through the years before we detected anything, uh, you know, I would go to some place to give a talk uh, and hear both sides. I mean, people would attack me or almost come to be able to attack me. And, uh, and others thought it was a ter- terrific, you know, venture so uh it it uh, and it took us too long so it became com- it, the controversy kept going i started we got this funded in 1994 and now it's 22 years later it, it's astounding to think that uh, I, I mean my stick to it of us for 22 years is not astounding but the nsf's is i think for them to be able to take on a very expensive high risk project and stay with it despite the fact that it had you know, a certain amount of controversy, and especially despite the fact that we had nothing to show for, not much to show for all those years. Uh, We, you know, we made some uh, uh, searches that showed they didn't exist at some level, and we trained some students, but we didn't have much to show. And the total cost of this over the, since 1994, is $1.2 billion. So it's a lot of money. So, Barry, the development of LIGO and the subsequent detection of gravity waves involved a lot of people and institutions over a relatively long period of time. Can you talk about the various roles of the important players? I, I guess the, the, the first important role was played probably by Kip Thorne. Uh, is it, he's a theorist in general relativity and had been a student. Maybe the first was, was John Wheeler, who was a 
the father of kind of general relativity field after Einstein's generation was gone, and he was at Princeton, and Kip Thorne was his student, and they uh, uh, wrote a book which is kind of still the the standard textbook on general relativity in the in the field, and there's actually a chapter on gravitational waves in that textbook. Uh, it doesn't exactly have LIGO, I would say, but it, it it has more on the bars, not too much experimental, actually. But I would say it was the thing that uh, established it so that people that were in physics uh, weren't just aware of gravitational waves being on the side and so forth. Kip Thorne then came, left uh, Princeton. He was a student at Princeton, came to Caltech, and he uh, taught general relativity at Caltech. And he kind of, I would say, stimulated the complete the, the the continuing interest in gravitational waves and maybe the detection of gravitational waves he's as a theorist not an experimentalist so his role was a little bit more of a cheerleader but a crucial a, cru- a crucial one i think uh, then it turns out that uh, a student of the guy that had developed the bars was the first person to look at uh, the idea that you might use interferometers, which would be more uh, sensitive. And like all things, after we, after many years later, when you're in the field, uh, we found out that the idea was actually first done by some, first seen by some uh, Russians in Moscow, but nobody knew about that. But that was earlier, which is true of many, many physics uh, ideas that they were first seen in the Soviet Union, first first started in the Soviet Union. Anyway, he, he looked at interferometry some, and then uh, a robust kind of R&D effort started in Europe especially, and the place in the United States was at MIT, and it was my colleague Ray Weiss who still works with me on uh, gravitational waves. And he, he started, uh, he was at, uh, he had come from Princeton to MIT as a junior faculty, and this is in the 19... Uh, maybe about 1970s, sometime, I don't know where it went in the 70s, maybe late 70s. And he uh, taught a course in general relativity because he had studied under Wheeler at, uh, at uh, also under Wheeler at Princeton. And in the process of, of uh, teaching that course, he did something that turns out to have been quite important, and that is that he he decided to assign students the idea of, it wasn't his idea, but the idea of doing the interferometry. Hmm. Uh, and in the process, he wrote a little note, uh, or did a lot of homework himself. It was probably his first teaching, so he worked at it harder than you do later. Um, and he did a lot of uh, calculations of what would limit it and how big it would have to be. And a lot of that was actually quite far-seeing. And, and uh, so that notebook, which was then put into an, has never been published, but it was put into an internal MIT note, uh, has a lot of the ingredients of what's in these, you know, what, what basically are the limiting things that you have to worry about and try to beat, uh, what's the scale of how big you have to make it and how much, how accurately you have to measure and so forth and so on. So he, he was really important. And found it, as I said, as somebody named Robert Forward was the first to look at interferometers uh, it's himself. But but Ray's work was really crucial. And then um, uh, uh, quite a bit of work was done in various groups in Europe. And then there was an a effort to develop an, a, a, a gravitational wave experimental group at Caltech. And uh, Ron Drever from Scotland, who had been working on this in Europe, was brought to Caltech. And then they went through a period of Ron Dre- of Caltech and MIT, who eventually started this project together. Um, that uh, Ron Drever, who came from Scotland, and and uh, Ray Weiss uh, didn't really mesh very well. They're very different. Very, they were very different kinds of experimentalists. Ray kind of from what I told you before, is very analytical. So he calculates calculates things and thinks about them deeply and then does them. And uh, Ron Drever was more of an intuitive kind of guy, somebody that had a sense that you should do something. And they kind of didn't, weren't able to work very well together. So, so uh, Kip Thorne 
tried to pull them together. That didn't work very well either, but that went on for a while. And then uh, uh, the, the NSF, uh, the people that were in charge of, of this kind of research in the NSF were very helpful and farsighted. And the NSF agreed to actually uh, support a study to develop a proposal that they would uh, look at in, at uh, the NSF. This was maybe 1985. Uh, and by 1990, it was a five-year study plan. And by 1990, a proposal was turned into the NSF. Uh, that proposal uh, uh, stimulated a uh, the NSF to not to approve the proposal. They liked the idea, but but they uh, wanted it to be more real. Uh, that they wanted to know really what it would cost, how big it would be, whether the technologies were real, where you would put it. And originally, the idea, which wasn't very well developed, was that this was a Caltech MIT project. And the Caltech uh, part of it would be somewhere near the Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. And MIT would build one uh, in Southern Maine, not so far from MIT. And uh, th those would be the two interferometers. Uh, the National Science Foundation decided that if they build this, there should be a national competition for where it goes. And the final result is it's in the state of Washington and Louisiana. So that's what happened. And then, uh, and then it floundered for a few years uh, because, it, as I said, it was the biggest project the NSF would ever take on, and uh, they didn't like the way it was being approached. And uh, I had been kind of on the committees that oversaw it at Caltech, but wasn't working in that area. I was actually involved at the with the Super Collider in Texas, which was. Uh, killed in, by Congress in 1993, and then I was asked to take over the, the uh, LIGO project, and within a year we got it approved by the NSF. So the following year we made a real design that they bought off on and costing, and you know, all that kind of stuff, and a plan. Um, I think what was unique in the plan and kept it, kept it, well, enabled us to get to where we are today, but kept it kind of unique from other things is we didn't know in 1994 how to do what we've done today. We didn't really have the technology. We didn't, hadn't done the R&D on a lot of the things. And, and so we decided to build that, to, the, the plan that, that I proposed in 94 when we went to the National Science Board was to make it uh, ev evolutionary, that we would uh, build the infrastructure in a way that was flexible enough it's kind of two thirds of the cost. And, and that was flexible enough that we could keep uh, evolving the interferometers that we put in as we learned how to do the technology. And that was not the way projects are usually done. If you send something in space, it better work completely the way it is now, or usually in labs or on an accelerator, it's the same thing. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Well, Barry, you certainly played an absolutely key role in all of this. In fact, uh, Michael Turner, who Don interviewed in episode six of STEM Talk, said when talking about LIGO and the tenuous path leading to its construction, that without your leadership, LIGO would not have happened. By all accounts, this is certainly true. So uh, please do not be overly modest, as I know you are, and tell us a, a little bit about your role in LIGO. Well, as I say, I came, uh, I knew about it a lot because we, in order to, Caltech's a zero growth institution. So uh, when we hire somebody in a new area like gravitational radiation, it means you don't replace somebody in some other area, say like nuclear physics. So we have a, kind of a real process. So I was involved in the, in the whole idea to start the field. And so I knew about it. I knew about the details of it pretty well. But I was, as I said earlier, I was working on the, on the super collider. Uh, the project really got in trouble at Caltech and MIT. They were proposing something. They were well in, over their heads. It was being done by 
scientists who worked kind of alone in labs and, as I said, didn't get along that well together. Um, in the er er early 1990s, uh, when they try after this study, which which ended up taking getting the NSF to take the project seriously, then uh, one had to develop a real proposal where, where if the NSF has to spend money, they're going to have to be convinced uh, that you really know what you're doing and that you're going to do something that makes sense and that you can manage it and so forth and so on. They they didn't do that very well. The NSF was on. I was right on the verge of canceling the project when the uh, uh, super collider was canceled by Congress. And uh, that was in October of 1993. And Christmas of 1993, the uh, head of physics department at Caltech and the president of Caltech asked me to take it over. And, uh, and I took it over. And then within a uh, year, and I hired a lot of people, luckily, uh, a lot of very good people that were available from the uh, demise of the SSC, of the super collider. Um, and, and we put together a, a proposal which had the ingredients that I said that it, we couldn't really convince anyone that we knew how to do what we do today because we didn't know how. So we, we had the story that we would make it totally uh, evolutionary and that it was plausible to be able to make these improvements, uh, that we would make the first um, device sensitive enough so that it could possibly determine gravitational waves. The key word is possible. So by possible, what, what I meant at that time was that uh, it wouldn't break any physical laws, but it wasn't what people predicted or would guess from, uh, from observations of potential objects that would give gravitational waves and that we would eventually get it to where we could um, you know, be in the region where it's expected. So I call that probable detections. And um, the, the uh, I think in all the time that Ken and I were on the National Science Board, it never happened. I don't know if it ever happened any other time, but in 1994, they decided to invite Kip Thorne and myself to testify at, to the National Science Board itself directly. It's generally done through the um, program managers at NSF. So we actually had a hearing with the National Science Board and talked for, I don't know, an hour or so and presented, he presented some of the theory and I presented the concept of what we would do and they approved it. And then keeping it probably, as I said, having the concept of it being evolutionary and uh, uh, continuing um, with a very strong research and development program through the years uh, has been the key to this success. And the second, uh, probably kind of less, less strategic but important, is that we met all the, the kind of things that you have to in a project. We spent, we didn't overspend, we met all the time scale goals, everything being on time and so forth through the years. So even though we didn't produce any great science, uh, we managed to basically satisfy all the the goalposts that were up that we had to reach. And so uh, that's it, nothing, no magic. It was just kind of good a, a good uh, way to evolve it and uh, they never lost confidence in us. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, the whole gravity wave story is really wonderful, starting with the prediction made by Einstein and then this long march of scientists sort of standing on each other's shoulders, eventually leading to the commitment of well over a billion dollars that you mentioned of public funds to build a risky and remarkable observatory that we, we call LIGO. And all of this was for no commercial, military, or geopolitical purpose. It was just to know, driven by human curiosity. I think this is wonderful stuff, and it's it's yeah, a, a bright spot. Yeah, I think it's it's really emblematic of what the NSF should be about and what so pure science should be. Uh, sometimes it, you know, I, I've been through the era when the laser was uh, discovered. And lasing and la the laser, and nobody thought that had it at that time. And it took quite a few years after that had any commercial application at all. And now it's a huge, you know. It, so some of these things will be this because it's so weak. Some of the technologies that we've developed have commercial application, but it's just not the reason to do it. it it's 
it's uh, the broad way. What's what, it's what makes you know modern living worthwhile that we can actually pursue things to understand them on a fundamental level. And absolutely. You once, speaking of the science, you once gave a talk at IHMC titled Einstein's Unfinished Symphony, right. Sounds right. from the Distant Universe. <laughs> is it finished now? Is, can we say the symphony's finished? No. 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 I'd say we've heard the first little beat, which we call a chirp. Uh, and uh, I think that the thing that's amazing, it'll go long past uh, our lifetimes, I think, before this is really exploited. But uh, the... Everything, well, there's two areas. One is that uh, everything we know about uh, fundamental physics, sort of the fundamental science for it, is based on either um, uh, physics at very short distances, which we call quantum physics, which is what the kind of things they do on particle accelerators, or physics at very long distances, which is general relativity, uh, Einstein's theory, which does everything from we know it's right basically because otherwise we couldn't drive down the road in our cars and stay and get to where we're going gps depends on general relativity so we know it's right at some level that can do gps but at the fundamental inner of the of the of the theory you need to have very strong effects not very weak effects and gps is just the acceleration of the satellites as they go around the earth that has to be corrected for but the strong effects are studying things like black holes and studying the, the real structure of general relativity. We know how to do physics at very long distances with general relativity. We know how to do physics at very short distances with quantum field theory, and we don't know how to bring them together. So what we have to do is understand much better what is in quantum field theory. And we have to understand things at long distances, and then somehow, someday, we'll get a unified theory. That's what Einstein wanted to do. Uh, anyway, the, the second, so that's a whole area that's just as, as fundamental as any physics problems you can deal with over the next century or so. And we'll get information as we get not just one event, but lots of events that involve very strong gravitational fields. So that's one area. The other area, which uh, me being a physicist, that's the area that intrigues me the most. But the other area is even probably more exciting to most people, and that is that Everything we know about uh, our universe comes from looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, one way or the other. You're looking at li uh, visible light, looking at infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, um, so forth and so on. And people have studied, and and we've seen that what we've learned about the universe has grown tremendously as we have moved beyond the just the optical spectrum. But of course, all phenomena don't emit light or electromagnetic ray, uh, rays. So this gives us a completely and potentially a completely new way to look at the universe, to look at it through signals that are emitted that have gravitational radiation and not just electromagnetic radiation. And in fact, the first one single event that we've seen illustrates all of this because uh, black holes, by their name, don't emit any anything electromagnetic. So these events that we saw couldn't be seen by anything in telescopes. Um, the fact that we saw uh, objects that were, the two objects that we saw were approximately 30 times the mass of our sun and, uh, you know, about the size of Los, An Los Angeles greater area. Yeah. You know, a very compact, dense object called a black hole but they weigh 30 times the mass of the sun. We didn't know from anything in astronomy that such heavy stellar black holes existed uh, before. Uh, now we know that they not only exist, but they exist in pairs because they had to merge like this. And that within the lifetime of the universe, that a pair of them can merge and be detected. So this is all already new astrophysics, if you want. So I think the future of learning uh, astronomy and astrophysics from using gravitational probes. It's going to take years to make sen uh, sensitive enough detectors. This is just the beginning. We know how to make them more sensitive. Again, in kind of the spirit of what I said about 1994, we don't know how to just convert ours to a more sensitive instrument, but we know what limits it and it's not fundamental. And I think making more sensitive instruments will happen over the coming decades.
So I think uh, both in terms of the future of astronomy and astrophysics and and the future of studying the most fundamental things in physics itself, this has a really bright future. From what I understand, one of the keys to this was a quiet environment. So how quiet are we talking? Uh, well, we, you know, we're, we're pretty good at isolating ourselves from whatever <laughs> happens around us. Most of the making it quiet is internal to us. So we try to create a, a start in the choice of the sites with something that's quiet. So we go to a rural area where things are fundamentally quiet. And as soon as we go there, because we're not as nothing, you know, in, in the continental United States is going to be that quiet. What we found immediately were things that weren't so quiet. In in uh, the state of Washington, for example, there's uh, there's the wind generators uh, for wind power up that are 10, 15 miles away, but they shake the earth because they could stand up and go around, shake the earth. And in Louisiana, we discovered that there were huge pipes that were carrying uh, oil uh, from, the, from the southern states to the northern states that went not so far from us that we could hear rumbling below. So, or they cut down trees and we could hear them. So basically, nothing's totally quiet. The real problem is mostly ourselves. Uh, our, our sister... Uh, project in Italy is actually much noisier than what we have to deal with. But but anyway, we deal with we start with ma- taking an environment that's that's pretty quiet, and then we have to isolate ourselves from everything that's noisy, and that's uh, a big part of the problem. That uh, no matter how much we work at it, the earth below us shakes at low frequencies. It just shakes, and we have to make it not shake so much in the apparatus and keep it down to where it doesn't bother us. And so to do that, we have very fancy uh, set of basically shock absorbers like you have in your cars. And uh, and then we have a very, very fancy system that's got feedback in it that actually senses the movement of the earth and corrects for it, like, like corrections are done in these earphones that you wear that basically correct for the ambient noise. So we we do that for the shaking of the earth. Uh, we have um, other limitations that aren't so much that are more technical and less the the earth itself that limit us. And an example is just how much light we have. We we, we need to have as many photons as possible in order to be able to make a very very tiny measurement. And so the, we have we've had a. Uh, we've had to develop a very, very special laser that's very, very powerful. And we amplify that light after it comes from the laser um, in our device itself. So so we have to be isolated and quiet, and we have to have technologies that, uh, you know, push things. And as I say, that's been kind of, kind of an evolutionary process, not the speaking of the site that was done in the 1990s. I don't always listen to podcasts. But when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Barry, could you talk just briefly about the International Linear Collider? Yeah, yeah. So this is this was fantastic for me. Uh, I, I I kind of. I'm I'm perennially like a graduate student. I'm most excited when I'm learning something new. And uh, although I had worked around particle accelerators my whole life, I even had a couple of students that uh, got theses on particle accelerators. So I knew a lot about it intellectually, but it hadn't been my subject. And uh, there was work for there's there's the big machine at CERN, which everybody knows about. It scatters uh, protons on protons. But for 50 years now, we've have been very successful in particle physics by having two companion machines, one that does protons on protons, which is much easier to do and a good way to kind of scan what's going on, but uh, have a companion machine that's electrons on positrons. And the reason the companion machine is so important is that an electron and positron are totally fundamental particles. A proton's not, it's a complicated particle. And so an electron and positron colliding and annihilating just makes pure energy. And so you can study things, but it's much harder to do. So the combination of doing something that's very precise uh, and uh, very interpretable 
along with something that's more of a scanning device, which is the proton. Proton one is how we've been so successful for 50 years. The problem is, so they've done that. The problem is that now as we got to the energy of the, of the CERN collider, it turns out if you have electrons that go around something that big, and that fast, they radiate away a lot of energy. Ele electrons uh, are very light compared to protons, and if they if you accelerate them around a circle, uh, they radiate too much energy. So, in order to make a companion machine to CERN, uh, it has to be linear. You can't bend the particles at those energies, and that means that rather than have a circular machine where you have particles one going clockwise, one going counterclockwise, and each time around they try to collide with each other. This is more like shooting two rifles at each other and having the bullets collide each other. So it's a very hard problem, as you can imagine. They get one chance, because once they go by each other, they don't hit. And so you have to make these beams so that they're incredibly accurate, incredibly well steered, um, and um, intense enough so that if you only go by each other once, there's a high probability of collision. So in order to do that, uh, people have worked, worked very hard in the 1990s on developing technologies to be able to do that. Uh, and then uh, in the early 2000s, they had basically developed the, the, the main technology. It would be equivalent to having developed in our, in our labs the idea of being able to use interferometers or something that, so that you could make the step. Uh, and uh, there were two competing technologies, one that worked in at very low temperature and one that was at room temperature. And there was, in trying to, you could only do one, of course, in trying to sort out which way to go, uh, I was asked to head a committee that uh, would make the choice because uh, I was a neutral outsider but knew the subject pretty well, or at least people trusted me. And so we uh, studied it and we picked uh, the uh, coal technology because it was more forward-looking. You could do it with either in principle, but it was more forward-looking and you'd get, uh, it would develop technologies that could be used in other accelerators and it would do this job probably better. So we picked that technology. I went back to LIGO and uh, the next thing I knew is then they asked me to run the design for it. And uh, we were kind of in the middle of this long path in LIGO. So I, I said I would spend 80% of my time for a few years doing that, but I wanted to come back and do this. So between 2005 and 20, turns out five years ended up being seven, 2005 and 2012, we did the design. What was fantastic is that I led the design of a, of a really difficult problem, uh, pulling together the best accelerator physicists from all around the world. Uh, to do it. The, the, and we did, so it was a long distance project. I couldn't do that and bring them all to one physical site because they all have home bases. And so we had physicists from Novosibirsk in Russia, from China, from Japan, uh, from CERN, from the US and so forth and so on. And, uh, and, and since they, were, they knew each other, for at least from a distance and respected each other, I had a, made a list at the beginning of the 20 people I wanted, really wanted on this project. And we got 19. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> what an amazing uh, undertaking. Um, yeah. I, ho I hope it actually gets built. What, what is the prospects for that? You, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting. It's, uh, it's, if it's built, it'll be built, built in Japan. Mm -hmm. The Japanese government got very excited by it as we finished the technical design three years ago. Uh, it was picked up by Abe himself, and he was uh, talking about it in his speeches. And at that time, I thought, well, you know, you can only capture the, you can only capture the attention of the top of the government for a short time, you know, that then, so this will either happen or it won't happen in a few months. Uh, I was wrong about that. It turns out that what they did, then I'm going to, my answer is a little long winded, but it's going to be a, a reason why it's, I, I don't know the answer. To, uh, the, anyway, that what they did is do what governments do, or maybe Maybe you, maybe also uh, corporations and universities as well. And that is when you have a big problem, you select a bunch of experts or a so-called blue ribbon panel. I would call this a super blue ribbon panel. They, they built, they, they, what they did instead of decide, they did or figure out how to decide, they appointed two super blue ribbon panels. One to look at the technology, the cost, and the, the project parts. The other to look at things like the economic impact and 
the sociology and international, how it could be made international and so forth. And these committees were probably the most distinguished people in Japan. Uh, they uh, then took you know, several months to appoint the committee. It took months to get them to ever get together. So my three months went past very quickly. Then they uh, finally met and did what was, in my mind, absolutely inevitable. They were too high level to ever do this job. So they each appointed a set of subcommittees. And those subcommittees are still studying the problem. So that's the so it's kind of a super due diligence being done by the Japanese government. I don't know whether it'll be done. They're obviously taking it very seriously and they're doing their due diligence. I think it'll depend. The one thing that matters some is it it'll depend somewhat on what's seen in the next couple of years at CERN. If there's nothing seen beyond the Higgs, it's a little less likely that they'll take it on. If we, if there's more science that starts coming out of CERN beyond the Higgs, then there's more motivation to do it. So I think from the scientific side, uh, that's the input. On the technical side, although they've studied it now for almost three years since we turned in the technical design, we've gotten no uh, feedback that they're questioning any any of the technology or the costing. I mean, they've asked us a zillion questions, but it basically seems to be well done. So hopefully it'll get done. It'll get decided within a couple of years, I think, 2017, 2018. That'd certainly be exciting. Yeah. yeah. I have it on good authority that you turned down the opportunity to be involved in the deep inelastic scattering experiment at SLAC in the 1960s, <laughs> which uh, resulted, I think, in a Nobel Prize for uh, Kendall, Friedman, and Taylor. Um, is, could you talk a little about that? Well, that's easy. I was, uh, I, I uh, when I came, after I got my PhD and I came to Caltech, I, one of the things I did in the first couple of years was to work with them. Uh, as a junior guy, and uh, as a as a very junior scientist, the thing that drove me the most, unfortunately, at that time, wasn't just the science, but kind of doing something on my own. And uh, I had the idea of how to do something that people hadn't done with antiprotons, and I proposed it at Brookhaven Lab instead of, and it got approved. And so I went off and did that instead of continuing on the experiment at Slack, which, uh, which ended up giving Ken, Kendall, Taylor, and Friedman the Nobel Prize. So I, and Taylor, Dick Taylor, who's always a good friend of mine, has kidded me about that for 50 <laughs> years. Yeah. M one of your other good friends said that, uh, that you saved your, uh, your letter uh, that you wrote them indicating that you really couldn't participate and that it was a doozy of a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also thought it was it was the boring. I yeah, I think I used some language that uh, Dick Taylor liked to throw back at me because I uh, I thought the things that were going to be the most interesting we were doing together when I went and that this was kind of cleaning up. I, I didn't anticipate that it would uh, find this discovery actually. So. Um, Barry, I understand that you are an avid reader of fiction, and especially from countries you visit, like Italy and Japan. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, why you like to read literature from these places? Well, I, I first, I, I have a bias, I, which is probably totally untrue, but it comes from me, and that is that I think that you can divide people who are creative from people who aren't in whether they read fiction. That's a, a simplification, but I think the traction of fiction has got to do with imagination uh, compared to just reading nonfiction. And ever since I was really young, I, I loved fiction. I loved storytelling and uh, things that, you know, are an imaginary world and imaginary ideas and so forth. So since I was really young, I, I, I loved uh, storytelling and what then ended up being fiction and I read a lot from the time I was really young. As I said, I didn't really know anything about science. If they asked me what I wanted to be when I was 8, 10, 12, 14, uh, it was going to be, I was going to be the great author, not the great scientist somehow. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> that was something I always wanted to do. And, uh, and then even, even as an adult, I always thought, you know, when I, when I retire from physics, I'm going to go back and write a novel or something. And I've always liked writing. I've done a lot of writing, even, you know, as a not just scientific articles, but more popular ones and so forth. So I've always enjoyed when I was doing the 
International Linear Collider. I had to write a weekly column, and uh, and I just loved doing it. It was so I always enjoyed doing that. I've always found, in terms of reading about cultures, I've always found you know American literature is not the only literature in the world, and uh, that a, a really good way to and being a physicist, I've traveled a lot, so uh, a good way to try to understand the cultures that you deal with is through their literature. Mm-hmm. And so I've always uh, uh, kind of tried to understand who were the main authors. Uh, the most puzzling is Japan. I mean, as hard as you try, understanding the Japanese culture, at least for me, even though I've worked with them for so long, is probably the most difficult of the advanced cultures. Uh, their, their way of, of thinking, their way of acting socially, their uh, approach to the world is just more different than from European or American or even Russian or Chinese cultures. And so I've read a lot of Japanese literature and I still don't understand the Japanese. That's why I can't tell you whether they're going to build this accelerator or not. <laughs> <laughs> Tie it all back together. <laughs> well, Barry, thank you so much for being a guest on STEM Talk and th- for this great interview. We've really enjoyed it. Yes, uh, thank you for the time. It was uh, uh, We've been speaking for quite a while and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So huh. thank you. Okay, Ken, I hope we see each other sometime soon. I hope so. We should conspire to make that happen. Yeah, let's make it happen. (laughs) Bye-bye. And and say hi to Simone. I will. Bye-bye. Bye, Barry. Bye. STEM Talk. STEM STEM Talk. talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Wow, that was such a fascinating interview, and it was so great to talk to Dr. Barish about the first direct detection of gravity waves and the observatory that made it possible. On most days, there's very little among the thousands of items filling up the 24-hour news cycle that will be regarded as important and noteworthy in 500 years. Much of it is, frankly, nauseating. (laughs) However, LIGO is a story of courage, curiosity, and intellectual audacity that will be noteworthy for a very long time. Barry is a modest fellow, but I'm not constrained by his modesty, and I can tell you there is little doubt that without Barry at the helm during an absolutely critical period in its development, LIGO would not have been completed. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for each episode. You can find us at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.